When talking about mass extinctions, most people will immediately jump to the one at the end of the Cretaceous, where big rock from space came and all the dinosaurs except for birds died out. And that then paved the way for mammals to rise into what we have today, a mostly mammal-dominated environments. But there's still some little footnotes, like the terror birds in South America, where these were dominant predators in many environments. But eventually, of course, the mammals did win the day. They were obviously going to be successful because they'd become successful everywhere else, right? Well, this new fossil suggests no, they really weren't that successful right away everywhere else. And that's because this new fossil comes from Europe, and specifically France during the Eocene. Dentanius Sucus crassiproratus was a massive about 6 meter or 20 foot long Sebecid crocodilian coming from southern France about 40 million years ago. So 26 million years after the extinction that killed the dinosaurs, which is plenty of time for mammals to have risen up and become dominant and pushed these kinds of crocodilians out of those ecosystems. But instead it seems like they actually did pretty well even in parts of Europe where we see a lot of early mammal diversity. As a Sebecid crocodilian, it's actually super interesting to look at its longer evolutionary history because the crocodilians today don't really represent the crocodilians of the past. When we first see the animals that are related to and eventually lead to crocodilians, we're going to be all the way back in the Triassic, over 230 million years ago with animals like Arizonosaurus. And the ankle structure is really important for telling that, but more importantly, it was on land. It wasn't swimming through the water like modern day crocodilians. And this tracks throughout most of the Triassic. There were other large crocodilian relatives that were on land. But during the end of the Triassic, there was another mass extinction. And this changed the kind of ecology that these animals were able to succeed in. And that's when we start getting more of these crocodilians adapted to the water. Eventually though, some, notably the Sebecids, left the water again and started wandering around on land. Despite being on land though, they're still a lot of what you would expect, especially with these large ones. Big head, pointy teeth, long body. It makes a lot of sense when you're looking at kind of the evolutionary pattern if you just took something like a Cuban crocodile, the most land adapted crocodilians we have today, and you just had them selectively bred over years to be even more land adapted, this is kind of something you'd get. Except again, this animal was much larger, pushing over 20 feet. The reason Dentaniosuchus was able to become so dominant in its environment is kind of a reverse of what happened in the Triassic, where the crocodilian-like animals were the dominant predators, but then mostly died out because of sudden climatic change and then the dinosaurs became more successful. Except this time it was in reverse. Both of these groups, the dinosaurs and the crocodilians, belong to the ruling reptiles, or archosauria. And that's because for over 160 million years, the dinosaurs were super dominant up until the end of the Cretaceous. And this fossil is really just showing us that while the dinosaurs weren't necessarily in charge, the archosaurs were still ruling for quite a bit afterwards. It kind of throws a wrench into this whole idea that immediately after the extinction, mammals just flourished and were totally successful with no problems whatsoever. They definitely had problems. Now, this isn't all entirely new. We did know the Sebecids did survive in Europe after that extinction. We just didn't really know exactly how large they were and how long they persisted. This one is one of the younger ones that we have, meaning that, yeah, they, they did pretty well there. So again, not that same kind of burst of diversity with mammals just immediately rising to prominence. And we've, again, known this for a while. The first fossil of Danteosuchus was actually found in 1931, but it was grouped with a different Zebecid that was already known. And then eventually people came back and looked at it and also found new pieces of it and were able to go, yeah, no, actually this is an entirely separate animal that was much larger than the other Sebecids in Europe at the time, such as Iberosuchus, which was somewhat smaller and is also mostly known from more on the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal. This new material also means that the researchers were able to better look at its relationships with the other Sebecids. And it's actually kind of interesting because they found it as the earliest branching member of the group, meaning that essentially they started to evolve. The branch that led to Dentaeosuchus actually branched off really early. You have a bunch more diversity as they spread around the globe during the Cretaceous, and then multiple lineages actually survive that extinction. It's really interesting to see that they actually did pretty dang well compared to especially the dinosaurs, for which they would have been fighting over a lot of that ecospace as moderately sized carnivores. 
The new skull also helps us to understand how large it could get, because even just the skull itself could get over a meter in length, or around three feet. So again, really big animal, and was likely eating a lot of the mammals that were around at the time. For example, you have many early relatives of things like horses or even deer that were present in the environment. The main evidence that it would have been eating these things are the teeth, because it had xiphodont teeth, which modern crocodilians don't have that. Xiphodont teeth are essentially teeth with little serrations on them, and it's something we see in many of the early crocodilians, but not so much in the modern ones, which have more conical teeth for grabbing and holding things. They can use the water to help hunt if it's something like a Nile croc eating a zebra it can go drag it into the water. If you're on land though, you don't have that water to assist. So your teeth need to be more suited to cutting, and that's what those serrations do. So it seems like Dentiosuchus and the other Sebecids all converged on this same kind of tooth shape that many theropod dinosaurs had. And that makes a lot of sense. It's really, really useful for hunting on land because you can do a lot more damage with those serrations than without. But of course, we don't have anything like Dentaeosuchus alive today. There were a few related animals that hung on even later than the Eocene into the Miocene, like Barinosuchus from South America. But they likely all went extinct for the same reason. And that's fundamentally that the temperatures started cooling down. As the Ice Ages started to envelop the world, many of the rich, warm forest environments that these animals were adapted to started to turn into grasslands, and there just wasn't enough there for the crocodilians in their various forms to succeed as much as they had. And so they did eventually go extinct, and a lot of that extinction is poorly understood. But it is kind of unfortunate, because land crocs have a long history, going back as far as 240 million years. And today we don't have any of them other than the Cuban crocodile, kind of. And that one is highly endangered, so it's really not that likely it's going to be around for that much longer. Unfortunately, we're just missing this massive burst of diversity that the crocodilians had. And it's really important to understand that even after the extinction of the dinosaurs, that these kinds of crocodilians were still very much a major factor in the evolution of the mammals that we have today.